Now I'm going to talk today about early experience and in particular the longer term outcomes that result from early experience. And uh, this will use a lot of my own work and research of my colleagues, but also uh, bringing in some work from other countries as well. Now, if we look at the current social and economic context, by 2050, the, in the EU, the working population is going to decrease by 50 million. Uh, but the elderly will grow by 50%. Now, that means we've got to do something about productivity. You know, we've got to, our populations have to become more productive, or else our living standards are just going to go down. And what, so we need to uh, maximise the skills in the workforce. Now, if you look at what skills are necessary for good outcomes, they are rising, they're getting more and more complex, and changing. For example, the, the, the job web designer. 20 years ago, it didn't exist. Now it's a very important job. It's estimated that for children entering school today, 70% of the jobs they'll be going into don't yet exist. I don't know what those jobs are going to be. I can tell you, though, that they'll be highly skilled jobs and jobs that demand adaptability. So those are the kinds of attributes we need to have in, our work, in, in the population in general. And this is going to involve cognitive and non-cognitive skills. And we need to think how these can be improved in the workforce. Now, why should we focus on the early years? Well, here are two quotes from two social scientists who've reviewed the evidence and come up with these conclusions. If the race is already halfway run, even before children begin school, then we clearly need to want to examine what happens in the earliest years. That's from Gosta Esping Anderson, a Danish social scientist. And then, like it or not, the most important me mental and behavioural patterns, once established, are difficult to change once children enter school. That's James Heckman, who won the Nobel Prize for economics in 1999. Now, Heckman produced this curve to illustrate the impact or economic return, in this case, on, in, on programs started at different stages of the life cycle. So if you start having some program starting in the preschool years, you have a very high rate of return over here. Whereas in school it falls off, and then after school it gets very low indeed. Okay, yeah. Um, now, there's a reason for that, and that's what I'm going to call brain malleability. That is, how adaptable is the brain to experience? How, how readily does it change as a result of experience? And we see it's very high in the early years, falls off across childhood, and then stays m more or less flat through the adult years with a very low level. But if we look at traditional patterns of government spending, they're very low government spending in the early years, which climb across the school years, stay fairly steady across adulthood, and then increase as people go into old age. In other words, governments spend money in exactly the opposite way to get maximum pro productivity. <laughs> OK. Um, now, we need to look at the kinds of early childhood services we have in a country. And this is going to depend upon social, cultural and social context. For example, back in the 50s, very few women with a child worked. That started to change in the 60s, so that by the 1980s, we saw quite a high demand for childcare. And that's increased even more so up to, at the present day. Um, now, in some countries, there's an ideology that women should stay home and look after their work, look, look after children, not work. And so like in, in other countries where we have a gender equality ideology. And this affects the demand for childcare, early, early education, and all those kinds of services, which in turn affects the kinds of family support, childcare, 
early childhood education centers that we have, and which in turn affect children's day-to-day -day experiences. Now, as children's day-to-day -day experiences in the home and out of the home, which are going to affect the child's development. I'll skip that one for now. That's funny. Now, if we look at some of the early risk factors, yeah. the star, okay, yeah, early risk factors um, for poor outcomes in children. If, if uh, parents have poor literacy and numeracy, uh, sorry, early risk factors lead to these kinds of poor outcomes. Poor literacy and numeracy, school failure, unemployment, antisocial behaviour and criminality, substance abuse, mental health problems and physical health problems. So what we want to do is reduce these early risk factors in order to reduce the uh, incidence of these problems later on. Now, one of the strategies for doing this is interventions with disadvantaged groups, because disadvantaged groups are much, much more likely to show these early risk factors. And we need to intervene early to divert developmental trajectories related to disadvantage, and we need to have an earlier and better identification of at-risk families, earlier and effective intervention and prevention. And the UK government has started to highlight early intervention, calling attention to neurological evidence and economic implications. So there's uh, starting to be a movement at a government level to recognise the importance of this early kind of early intervention. Now, one very well-known study which was done in America in the 1960s uh, called the Perry Preschool Project. And it took place in a suburb of Detroit called Ypsilanti. And it was a quite a small-scale study where they took 123 African-American children living in extreme poverty. And they chose half of them at random and put the, them in a program to receive special intervention, and the other half were left to their own devices. And the program was early high school classes, which is basically a form of early preschool education, with planned learning activities for the children from age three upwards, and weekly home visits to help the families cope with the children at home. Now these happened between age three and age six. Then at age six, the children all went to the same schools because they were living in the same neighbourhoods. So it was only that period, three to six, which differentiated these two groups. Now, because this study started in the 1960s, these children are now in their late 50s. And so we got very long-term data on these children. And what do we find? The red is the programme group. And if we look at the likelihood of earning more than $20,000 at age 27, better in the programme group, or at age 40, better in the programme group, being employed, better in the programme group, having your own home, better in the programme group, own car, better in the programme group, having a savings account, all, all those economic indicators, the kids who had that early intervention doing a lot better. But it's not just economic indicators, the likelihood of having discipline problems in school, less for the programme group, likelihood of arrested more than five times at 27 or at 40, less. Like the violent crime or drug crime, much less. So on a range of indicators, we see that this program, which only took place between age three and six, had this, these lo really long-term impacts. And what people have done is calculated what are the savings, in this case at age 21, of the reduced dependence on social benefits, the reduced crime, the better educational outcomes and so on. And they, they add up to about $88,000 per child. But the programme cost only $12,000 per child. So you're getting a 7 to 1 benefit ratio. Really big. It increases even more as the children get older. But when you look at studies like that, you think, ah, oh, wow. Let, that's wonderful, we should do this for everybody. But hang on a moment. This was a very special sample. Very poor African-American kids living in extreme poverty in Detroit. Is this gonna work for everybody? May not. We need general population studies. So, 
This is what we did in what we call the EPI study, the Effective preschool, uh, Provision of Preschool Education Study in the UK. What we did, starting in 1997, we recruited 3,000 children who were sampled to represent the sort of general population of England at that time. Uh, they came from, at, we recruited them at age three, we recruited them from every kind of preschool centre which existed in England at that time. Nursery classes, playgroups, private day nurseries, nursery schools, local authority day nurseries, and what we call integrated centres, which provided family support and early childcare. And then we had a group at home who didn't have any form of early provision at all. And we assessed these children at age three, and then regularly through as they grew older. And we've just, last year, reported on these children when they were 16 years old, after they'd taken their GCSEs. But when they were uh, at three, we uh, collected a lot of information about the families, but also a lot of information about the kinds of settings that they spent their days in. And we looked at the kinds of uh, learning experiences that were offered to these children, both in the home and in the various centres that they attended. And we also followed them through school and we looked at the kind of schools that they went to. Now, this study um, has been very influential. And you, those of you who have a preschool child, or have had a preschool child, know that from 2004 on, you had free preschool place. Right? That was the result of this study. Uh, some of you may have got a two-year-old child, and recently you will have been given a free preschool place for that two-year-old child, if you're in, in a 40% in a most disadvantaged. Again, that was the result of the study. Um, so this study has a, has a lot of influence. Uh, but, and we produced about a, getting on for 80 or so papers from this study. I'm going to give you some quick highlights from this study. At the start of school, Compared to children who didn't have any preschool education experience, children who had one to two years were doing better. And the green is if they went to a high quality centre, the blue is if they went to an average centre, and the grey is if they went to a high quality, sorry, that's low quality, average, and that's high quality centre there. So we see that the quality makes a difference. But we also see that some children had an extra year of preschool education. And they do even better still. That's low, average, and high. So we see both the quality and the duration of the children's preschool education experience affects their development. This is in terms of months of developmental advantage in the first year of school that the children showed on a literacy measure. So those children who had three years of high quality preschool before starting school had over seven months developmental advantage over kids who had no preschool experience. Now, if you're a five-year-old child in the first year of school, a seven-month developmental advantage is a huge advantage. Okay. Now, if we look at how the, these effects at the start of school compare with other factors in a child's life, we find gender, girls do better than boys, low birth weight children do worse than average birth weight children, the duration of preschool is quite important, the quality of the preschool is also important, the social class of the children is important, and also, but the biggest effect was what we call the home environment, or particularly the home learning environment. <laughs> now, what do we mean by this? Well, when the children were three years old, we asked the parents about activities that happened in the home. We asked them in total about 14 activities. And we found that seven of these activities were particularly linked to the child's development, or seemed to be consistently linked to the child's development. So an example would be um, reading to the child, or painting and drawing, or um, playing with numbers and shapes, or the alphabet, or learning a song, or a poem, or a nursery rhyme, or going to the library. So we'd ask the mother a question like this. Um, Does anybody at home ever read to the child? And some mothers would say, oh, no, I don't bother with that. I leave it to the school. Others would say, uh, oh, I do it every now and again when I get a chance. And some would say, I do it every other night. And some would say, I do it every night. And so we get a, a sort of continuum of frequency of these events. 
And we'd add up how much all of these different kind of learning related events happen, and we call this the home learning environment. And we found at the start of school, this was the strongest predictor of children's cognitive and social development. And it was consistently linked to children's development right through to the teenage years. Okay, so that's just showing how, it, how we scored it. We have these measures here. We if, it was, if it didn't occur at all, we called it zero. If it occurred almost every day, we called it seven, and we have various scores in between. Okay. Now, as the children are going through school, in the English system, and I can't remember what the situation is in Wales, because they've recently changed in Wales. They have national assessments at age seven? Yeah. Now, we took the data from the national assessments at age seven in England, and this is the preschool group here. These are professional family, children from professional families here, children from skilled families here, and children from unskilled or semi-skilled families down here. And you see that uh, the gap between the preschool group and the no preschool group is fairly steady. The, the children from the professional families do as well in terms of the extra advantage they get from the preschool as the children at the, at the, at from the unskilled families. Uh, and, but you see this gradient here reflecting social, cl social class differences, which is common in almost every study you care to name. But what we have here at line two is the expected minimum level of attainment for any seven-year-old. And what we find is that children from professional families score well above this line with preschool. They also score well above the line without preschool. The children from skilled families score well above the line with preschool and just above the line without, pre, uh, without preschool. But for the children from unskilled families down here, they score above the line with preschool, but on average below the, below the line without preschool. Now that means they're much more likely to be kept down in class, kept back a year, or put into special needs classes or something of that kind. So while the, abs the uh, absolute difference for different social classes of attending a preschool is much the same, the consequences for the unskilled group is much more profound. Now, we also were able to examine what was it about particular preschools which led them to have particularly strong effects on children's development by doing case studies of particularly effective preschools. And this is what we found. There were five areas which are particularly important in making effective preschools. The quality of adult-child verbal interaction, lots of interaction, particularly responsive interaction, with extending the child's utterances. The staff's knowledge of understanding of the curriculum. The staff's knowledge of how to young children learn the staff ability to, to help children resolve conflicts when they fight over or row over objects or whatever. And also the staff skill in helping parents to support children's learning at home. So these all contributed to um, making a, a difference in different preschools. And these sorts of findings have been incorporated into government training programs which have been introduced for preschool workers now. Now, as the children have gone into school, we need to allow for the fact that the school itself is going to affect the children's development. So we need a measure of the different kinds of schools the children are attending. Well, in England, we have data on 600,000 children in every year in over 16,000 primary schools where we got data on their national assessment results at age seven, then at age 11, and, and subsequently. Now we can use that data to calculate which schools are producing most progress in the children's development, having allowed for whether they've come from a poor family or a deprived neighborhood or whatever, yeah? And so we can have a measure of effectiveness of each school in the country. And Schools where children make greater progress than predicted on the base of initial attainment and pupil and area characteristics are more effective 
and schools, schools which will make less progress are less effective. And this gives us a continuous scale of school effectiveness. And when we have that, we can do this kind of modeling exercise. We can take child factors, like the gender of the child, the birth weight of the child, uh, the ethnicity, and so on. Family factors, like fa parent education, social class, family income, family size. The home learning environment I just told you about, things in the home which help learning. The preschool, the quality and the duration of the preschool, or the effectiveness of the primary school. And in the secondary school, we can add in sec effectiveness of the secondary school as well. And we can look at the outcome like reading or mathematics or so, uh, behavior problems as well. And this is what we find in some of the results. For example, at, at age 14, to give one example, uh, every child in the country in England at the time took uh, standard assessments in literacy and numeracy. And we can look at the effects of different factors on those children's scores. And we find family income is important. Children from rich families tended to do better, other things being considered, than children from poor families. But the biggest effect of all is mother's education. The red is literacy and the blue is numeracy. Mother's education has by far the biggest effect on the children's scores. And then we have father's education. Note the effect of father's education is about half that of mother's education. So now we know mothers are twice as important as fathers. Or we should tell all these fathers to get off their butts and do a bit more with the kids because that's why this difference exists because mothers do a lot more with the children than the fathers do. Then we have socioeconomic status, social class. That also has a, quite a strong effect on both literacy and numeracy. Then we have the home learning environment. Now we measured the home learning environment at age three, age six, age seven, age 10, but this is the effect from age three, which is the by far the strongest effect. And we see that e this is many years later, the, the learning environment those children had in the home when they were in preschool period is still having a very strong effect on their later literacy and also on their numeracy as well. Then we have the effect of going to uh, a high quality preschool versus no preschool. It's quite a strong effect on literacy, but an even stronger effect on numeracy. Then we have the effect of going to a a highly effective primary school or a low effective primary school. We see effect on literacy and also on numeracy. Now notice that these two effects here for preschool and primary school are about the same, okay? Yet the children in our study had been to a preschool on average for about 18 months. They'd all been to a primary school for six years. So I leave you to make the calculation about how important preschool is, okay? Um, now, we can also look at children who say went to a very highly effective preschool but then go on to not so effective primary school. Or conversely, they go to a, a very low effective preschool and then on to a highly effective primary school or all the combinations of that, okay? We can look at the interaction between their preschool and their primary school experience. Now, here, in this group here, we have a group who went to a low effective preschool. And yellow is if they went to a low effective primary school. And red is if they went to the average primary school. And then gray is if they went to a highly effective primary school. And we see the difference for this group of the primary school is very, very pronounced, very, very marked. There are very big differences there. So the slope, as we go up that line, is very, very steep. Then we have children who went to the average preschool here in the middle. And that's low effective primary in yellow, red is the average primary, and gray is the highly effective primary. And we see that the primary school makes a big difference here as well, but not as marked as it was down here. Then we have the children who went to the most highly effective preschools of all, and that's low, average, and high primary school. And we see there's virtually no difference. It's as if the high quality preschool has inoculated the kids against the effects of bad teaching in the primary school. <laughs> They've learned to learn, and they learn almost regardless. We actually, in the analysis of the, the whole population, all, the whole data in the country, for all 600,000 children in a year, 
we found a somewhat similar effect with regard to high ability children. If you look at high ability children who start, the start in primary school with very high ability, and some of them will go to a low effective school, some will go to an average school, and some will go to a highly effective school, they end up at the end of primary school doing almost equally well. They're very little affected by the effectiveness of the school they go to. On the other hand, if you look at low ability children entering primary school, there it makes a very big difference for those children what kind of primary school they go to. So they improve dramatically if they go to a highly effective primary school. So the effectiveness of teaching is seems to have its most dramatic effects on the lowest ability children. And there's a gradient in terms of the level of, effect of influence upon the child where it's high quality teaching is most effective with the low ability children, moderately effective with the average ability children, and has relatively little effect on the high ability children. Okay, but it wasn't just academic outcomes. <coughs> on social outcomes, like self-regulation, the ability to control your behavior, plan ahead and so on, the, and pro-social behavior, showing empathy towards other children, sharing your toys with other children, being nice to other children. This is the effect of low, average, or high quality preschool. When the children are 11 or at 14, very similar results, we find that their effects on these social behaviors are still present many, many years later. So these preschool experiences affect both academic and social outcomes. Now here's another kind of graph. This case, what we're doing is we're looking at children at different stages of the life cycle on, the, on a measure related to numeracy. So we got a measure at age three, a measure at age five in reception class, age six in year one, age seven in what's called key stage one, age 10, year five, and then key stage two, which is age 11. And we can look at these children's scores on these assessments at different age points. Now, if I did that for 3,000 children, you would see 3,000 lines crisscrossing that page in a very higgledy-piggledy manner, and you wouldn't be able to make head nor tail of it. So what we do is we do something called a group trajectory analysis, which looks at all 3,000 trajectories and says, is there a common pattern or not amongst these 3,000 trajectories? And when we do that, we find six fairly common patterns which account for most children in the study. Zero would be average, so we have, and this is a one standard deviation above average. And what we find is there's a certain group of children, about 12%, who start off very high, and they stay high all the time. Another group of children also start high, but then they fall off to be about average. Then we have two groups, two big groups, who start off around average. One of those groups climb up and then are fairly, st uh, fairly steadily above average. Another fall off and then below average. Then we have two groups who start off very low. One of these groups climbs up to be about average, and the other state, about 8% of kids just start off very low and they just stay low all the time. Now you can learn some lessons from that. One lesson is this. Some of these trajectories are really favorable. You'd like your child to be in group six, or maybe group four, or if it starts off not doing so well, maybe group two is okay, that's a favorable trajectory. You wouldn't want your child to be in group one, or in group three. Okay, those are unfavorable trajectories. So you can ask the question, what affects the likelihood of a child being in an unfavorable trajectory versus a favorable trajectory? And the answer is a good home learning environment in those early years, good preschools, and also good primary schools also affect this as well. But another lesson you can learn from this, suppose you draw a vertical line where I'm indicating here. Imagine a vertical line going up there, okay? Now what is happening to the right of that line? Nothing, that's right. Everybody's staying in more or less the same relative position. All the change is taking place down here. That's the preschool period. Now that's not to say that if you take, a, say, an eight-year-old child and you intervene with that child who has needs, you couldn't produce change for that individual child. But what it indicates is on a population level, if you want to produce change across a population, 
you need to interact in the preschool period. Okay, and that's where you need to act. Okay, now, uh, one of the major lessons I have from research is if somebody produces a study and nobody else can produce the same result, don't believe it. <laughs> Whereas if you can replicate the finding consistently many times over, then that's a finding which is really worth knowing about. So in order to see whether we could replicate these findings, we, did a pa we, we uh, had an arrangement with people in Northern Ireland to do a parallel study in Northern Ireland, where 850 children were recruited in Northern Ireland and followed from age 3 to 11, with exactly the same measures being taken of the children at the same ages in Northern Ireland and so on. And I'm not going to go through all of the results, but basically they found similar results to the England study. And at age 11, allowing for all background factors, the quality of pre the preschool persists until age 11, which when we had to finish the study. We, uh, the Northern Ireland government ran out of money at that point and they stopped the study. And what we find is that high quality preschool improved English and maths in the school and improved progress in maths during primary school. And children who attended a high quality preschool were 2.4 times more likely in English and 3.4 times more likely in maths to attain the highest grade at age 11 than other children without preschool, other things being equal, social class, parent education, and so on. Now imagine that. You know, if you're a minister of education, here's a way you can increase the number of children getting high scores on maths in a fairly straightforward way. And uh, you know, I think most ministers of education would like that. <laughs> That's a very big effect. And it basically mirrors the effects in England. Okay. So what can we conclude from these studies? To cut it down to the bare bones, what matters is a good home learning environment before school in particular. L later as well, but it's particularly effective before school, which offers good learning opportunities to the children. Good preschool for longer duration will also boost those children's development, but also good primary schools matter. Now, children with all three of those advantages will outperform children with two, will outperform children with one, who will outperform children with none of those advantages, all other things being equal. Now, how important are these differences? Well, let me illustrate the, the importance of these differences in this way. Let's take two children, equally deprived from disadvantaged home backgrounds. One of these children we give all three of those advantages to, the other one we give none. What happens is, the child with none will end up close to the bottom of the class, right? very likely in special needs. Right? The child with all three of those advantages will be in the top half of the class. So that's, the, you know, in real, in sort of everyday terms, that's the kind of magnitude of all these advantages being put together. So they're very real, important effects. So conclusions, what we found was from age two upwards, all children benefited from preschool. We looked at children who started below, below age two and it didn't make any difference. Zero to two, no difference. Two upwards, every extra month counts. The quality of preschool matters. Also, we found, this is something which surprised us. Part-time has equal benefits to full-time. Some of our children went for five mornings a week. Some of them went for five full days a week. It made no difference. Those who went for half-time did equally as well as those who went for full-time. It's a bit like vitamins, you know, once you get your dose, it doesn't matter if you double your dose, you know, it doesn't do you any extra good. There is a possible, there is a subgroup of children where this doesn't hold. The, the, the very, very deprived children did benefit a little bit from extra from the full-time. But for the majority of children, this was generally true. Part-time is equally good as full-time. These preschool effects in our studies persist until teenagers. We, last year we published the results at age 16 on the GCSE results where we saw clear effects in the, along the lines I just told you about. We just finished analyzing the 18-year-old results on A-levels, etc., and they aren't published yet because we just looked at the data, uh, but the, the essentially the same effects are coming through it in the 18-year-old results as well. And also we see that high quality preschool could to some extent protect the child from the effects of a low effective school. Um, well obviously we want to 
have all our schools to be effective, but never be, some will not be quite so good. This work has had a, long, uh, a big policy impact. A free part-time early education and care place from three years old in 2004. This was extended to two years old, down to two years old, for the 40% most deprived from 2013. We had maternity leave increased to one year. From previously, it was five months, because we also produced evidence on children, mothers who worked in the first year versus mothers who took, who took a year off. We found some extra benefits for those children, which, which led to the maternity leave being increased. We have a new early years curriculum, new training programs for early years staff, and an acceptance at early years spending as part of government responsibilities. And we also have the, the setting up of children's centres, which are affected by this work, where we found that integrated centres, which offered family support, as well as early childcare and early education, were particularly effective. This one may surprise you, the acceptance of earlier spending is part of government responsibilities. Um, when we pre first presented our evidence back in 2002 to the government, uh, Margaret Hodges, the Minister of Education, Minister for Children in, in those days, she recommended that um, we have a free preschool place for everybody. But of course the Treasury controls all the money and they say, oh, hang on, let's have a look at this. So they have to look at the evidence. We show the evidence to them. Eventually, we convince them. Uh, it's an interesting political story how that happened, but I think I haven't got time for that now. Uh, but uh, we got Treasury to agree to it. And uh, that led to the 2004 Children Act. Now, in 2010, we had a new Conservative government take over after <laughs> the recession on a cost-cutting agenda. The first thing they said on entering power is we're going to cut all government spending by 20% across the board, okay? And we're going to tell you in October where those cuts are going to be. So everybody lobbies the government in the summer of 2010 to try to affect those government cuts. We lobbied the government, amongst other people, telling them about the evidence on the importance of preschool education, etc. And the result was, when the cuts were announced in 2010, the spending on preschool education was virtually untouched whereas almost every other area of government spending was reduced. Now, I think this is a profound change in government policy because in 2000, there was no state spending on preschool education except if children were disadvantaged. Yet in 2004, we have this universal provision provided by a Labour government. Now, you may think, ah, maybe this is just because we had a Labour government. But then when we have a Conservative government you know, take charge, they still protect his spending, and, and that, will, that will now stay as part of the pattern of general government provision. And also, they expand, it was the Conservative government who, who actually expanded the provision to the, down to two years for the 40% most deprived. So even a cost-cutting government, as it were, has accepted that this is part of the government responsibilities. Now, it's not just British evidence which points in this direction. We can look at abroad. In the USA, a study of over 12,000 children found that compared to children with no preschool, children with high quality preschool, in this case it was just whether they had teachers who were trained or not, did better, 1.6 points better, than children without preschool. And in uh, even in preschool without, without trained staff, low, what they call low quality school, there was an advantage as well. This advantage was even stronger for children living in poverty or whether mother had very low education. So that's essentially the same results in America that we found in the UK. Now in Norway, they started to provide preschool, pre free preschool to children from age three during the 1960s and 70s, which led to a gradually a huge increase in preschool attendance over those years. Now in Norway, they keep records of everything that happens to you. They know your birth weight. They know whether you're ill. They know whether you went to hospital. They know what drugs you took. They know whether you're immunized. They know your school results. They know your tax uh, level. They know your income level. And they know whether you're on benefits, etc., etc. Okay. So somebody, some uh, people, economists working in the in the uh, Norwegian government, went back to these data from the 60s for children born in the 60s and 70s, and because they rolled out the preschool gradually across the country, they were able to work, and they knew which 
region each child was born in, they knew which child had had preschool and which hadn't. And then they followed these children right through to adulthood. And what they found was the children who had attended preschool versus those who hadn't had higher education levels, and better job outcomes in later life, and higher income in later life. <coughs> now, they did a, a, a study in Denmark, which is uh, wh where they again used their national records of everybody in the country. They matched together the records of every child in the country with the, the records they had on every preschool centre in the country. And they know which staff which work, work in which preschool, what are the training and qualifications of those staff, they know which children go to which preschool and so on. And they then also were able to follow those children up and look at the educational records of those children. And they looked at the, this Danish registered data on the whole population and they picked out these five quality indicators of preschool, like staff-child ratio, male staff in the preschool, pedagogically trained staff in particular, stability of staff in particular. And they then looked at whether these were related to the children's later educational progress. And what they find is controlling for background factors, better preschool quality was linked to better test results in the ninth grade. That's age 16. The fact that we find long-lasting effects of preschool, even after 10 years of schooling, is quite remarkable. Now, I love this study. I think it's one of my, my favourite studies. The reason it's one of my favourite studies is this. If you look at that very early study I told you about, the Perry Preschool Project, it was only 123 children. So you think, ah, oh, it's a very small-scale study. Maybe it will work with, you know, with, lots, with lots of people. You could look at our EPI study in England, and you could say, oh, well, it's got 3,000 kids. But maybe they had a bias in their sampling, or something went wrong, you know. You can always quibble. Almost every study under the sun you can produce some quibble about. Try and apply those quibbles to this study. It, there's no possibility of any bias in the sampling whatsoever because it's the whole population of the country. You, know, you can't, you know, there's no way out. You know, it, it's, uh, so, uh, it, uh, it's very convincing evidence. There's also been some studies on smaller scale in Asia and South America like Bangladesh, Uruguay, Argentina where we find that children who've been given preschool attend, do better in their educational results in all of those countries. So in a wide range, what we're seeing is a, a build-up of evidence over a, a wide range of countries showing this essentially the same pattern. And again, these results are very long-term. This is a study done by a couple of economists where they looked at, they were, in 1958, somebody, a uh, chap, a pediatrician in Bristol, actually, um, Butler, Neville Butler, his name was, that's right. He recruited a sample of about 11,000 children born in a particular, I think it was every child born in April 1958 or something like that, uh, or from all over the country. And he collected data on these children across their lifetime. Okay? Now, in 1958, only a small number of kids would have got preschool because of a voluntary organisation like a church group or parents paying for it or something like that. Uh, and, but what these people did when they followed up these, the data on these children who were born in 1958, they found the effects on cognition and socialisation were long-lasting. And controlling for child, family and neighbourhood factors, there were long-lasting effects from preschool education. Preschool led to better cognitive scores at age 7 and 16. And in adulthood, preschool was found to increase the probability of good educational qualifications, employment at age 33, and better earnings at age 33. So these are really long-term results. Again, from a, a, in this case, a, a, a British sample. Other kinds of evidence. This is data I got from the World Bank. It, looking at data from Latin America. The red line is the percentage of children who get some kind of preschool education in those countries. And what we see in pa Paraguay, Dominican Republic, Colombia, it's very low. Whereas in Cuba, it's virtually 100%. Now, the blue line is the children's scores on literacy, on standard literacy tests across in the school years in those countries. And what we see is the blue line almost exactly follows the red line. Okay? Now, and the green line is basically under five mortality, the likelihood of dying or having a serious illness in the first five years, and that goes in the opposite direction. Now, when we look at this, we first of all see this very clear correlation between educational att attainment and literacy and preschool provision. But you might ask yourself, 
Cuba, look at Cuba. It's doing really, really well on these child outcomes. Very low mortality, very good literacy, also very high. You know. Why is Cuba doing so much better than all these other countries? Is it because Cuba's richer than all these other countries? No. Cuba's a lot poorer than Argentina or Chile or Uruguay. Yet what Ch Cuba does is from pregnancy onwards, it has polyclinics which provide free pregnancy checks um, for every child in the country. You get uh, free immunizations, you get free health checks early in life, uh, free childcare if the mother wants to go back to work, and then and the child's children are three, free preschool education for every child in the country. <coughs> so Cuba, despite not being all that rich, devotes its resources to child services, and that leads to the much better outcomes in Cuba. <coughs> now, the gains from early childhood education and care are in terms of educational achievement improved, special education and grade repetition reduced, behavior problems, delinquency and crime reduced, employment, earnings and welfare dependency improved, smoking, drug use and depression reduced, which in turn leads to decreased cost to government. Schooling costs, social service costs, crime costs, healthcare costs. And when economists have looked at the savings here versus the costs of the preschool, in almost every case they find that there's a significant extra saving over and above the costs in, uh, of, the, uh, of the provision. And that applies across the board for the whole population. The savings are most dramatic for the poor families. But, they, but across the board there are savings all the way. Here's another kind of evidence. The OECD, that's the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is a group of all the developed countries in the world, they do a standard survey every so often called, the, called PISA, Program for International Student Assessment. And what they do is they give a standard literacy test on a standard numeracy test to a random sample of children in all of the OECD countries. And what they find is that certain countries do a hell of a lot better than other countries. People, children in Shanghai do way better than most other kids. Children in New Zealand do extremely well. Children in Finland do extremely well. Children in Singapore do extremely well. In the UK, we're about somewhere in the middle. Children in the USA do extremely badly. Uh, children in... Um, where, where is this? Do badly. Uh, Greece and Portugal do extremely badly. So there's, you know, uh, uh, so we, we find that kind of thing. Now, what, PISA, what the OEC did is they looked at these results across all of these countries. And what they found was that 15-year-olds who had attended preschool were on average a year ahead of those who had not. And also the PISA results suggest that preschool participation is strongly associated with reading at age 15 in countries that sought to improve the quality of preschool, so the quality is important, and also provide more inclusive access to preschool education. So that's another kind of international data which is all pointing in the same direction. The OECD say this in their report, widening access to pre-primary education can improve both overall performance and equity by reducing socioeconomic disparities among students if extended coverage does not compromise quality. Okay? So um, we see you know, a range of evidence from very small scale to big studies, to total population studies, to international comparisons, etc., all showing this exact the same pattern of results. There is the evidence is, uh, is getting through to quite high levels of government, even in America. For example, Ben Bernanke, who was at that time head of the Federal Reserve, or in other words, the second most powerful man in America, said research increasingly has shown the benefits of early childhood education and efforts to promote the lifelong acquisition of skills for both individuals and the economy as a whole. The payoffs of early childhood programs can be especially high. Now, on the basis of that kind of statement, Obama tried to introduce uh, free preschool education across the board in the USA. He completely failed. He failed because education in America is entirely a state responsibility. Therefore, the federal government cannot make a law about it. It has to be decided by each state individually. And what that meant is that some states have it and other states don't. Minnesota, Massachusetts, California, and various other ones have it. 
Others, like Alabama, Georgia, Nevada, don't. So you get a big, di huge differences across the states now in this. So what lessons can we draw? The early years are very important, both in terms of the home environment and also the out-of-home environment. Preschool provision is part of the infrastructure for a successful society. If we want to think about maximizing the potential of our population, we have to think about our preschool services because that's where we're going to boost children most for the least effort, as it were. And the changes we produce at the preschool level will be long term. And also, if we miss out on those preschool experiences, it's very, very difficult to compensate later on. And high quality preschool boosts development. Parenting, as I say, is also extremely important. In, in fact, the parenting <coughs> effects are twice as strong as the preschool effects. Uh, in Bangor, we have a, 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 a body of work which has been looking at parenting programs and showing that those parenting programs are extremely important in, boost in changing children's developmental patterns. That's very important. Um, but uh, those parenting programs, by and large, will only be applied to a, a particular proportion of the population, whereas preschool can, can lift the whole population curve for the whole population. Okay, I'll... How are we doing for time? I better stop there then, I think, yes. I've, I've got some cost-benefit work here, I won't go on to that. <laughs> I'll stop there and throw the floor open to questions. I think uh, teaching in a primary school is, is crucial. I mean, I was, over, I was sort of trying, you know, overstating the case to make right. the point as it were. What I'm saying is that if we look at the data on effective teaching and which, who, which kids benefit from effective teaching versus ineffective teaching, what we see is that the level of progress that relatively low ability children make is very dramatic you know, dependent upon the quality of the teaching, right? The, the, the relative improvement decreases as the ability level of the child increases. So if you have a very high ability child, he's relatively less affected by the differences in the quality of the teaching, yeah? So you get that gradient, okay? Now what I'm saying is the very high quality preschool gives the children learning skills which helps them, as it were, uh, be less affected by the differences in teaching than they would have been without preschool. Yeah. They can compensate for the ineffective teaching. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I suppose it's a related point, but do you have any opinion about, about the kind of appropriateness of preschool delivery within school? Because the majority well, of, of yeah. our provision is within schools. Yeah. And therefore, if we're having children who get a poor preschool experience yeah. and a poor primary school, there's no compensation. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, first of all, I'd say that in general, the preschool provision across the whole of the, country, across the, whole of the UK is, can be improved a lot better than it is at the moment because we have a comparatively low training of staff in, in that area. Uh, we're in the situation that the Scandinavian countries were 30 years ago at the moment. So we have 30 years of catch-up to do in that respect. Um, we looked in our study at some preschool provision which was school-based versus preschool which was voluntary-based or private-based or a whole range of those things. And what we found is it didn't seem to matter too much uh, in terms of you know, the effects on the children. What mattered was whether it was high quality or not. And high quality was in terms of offering lots of stimulating interaction with the children, lots of learning opportunities for the children, play-based learning. You know, when I say learning opportunities, I don't mean a child sat at a class in front of a blackboard, right? 
I mean, you know, you, you have play-based activities which provide learning opportunities for the children, okay? That was what it was important. Now, if that took place in a school environment or a non-school environment, it would boost the children's development. So that was why it was important. And, they, and we found some school environments where that did take place and some where it didn't. And also we found some non-school environments where it did take place and some where it didn't. So that was what was important. Um, to some extent, training of staff affects this partly. To, I mean, it's not just training of staff. I mean, there's, there's something about the characteristics of staff themselves besides the training which is important. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to control for the basic personalities of staff. It is very easy to control the level of training they get. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's some things we can make a regulation about and some things we can't make a regulation about. Um, so, that I would say that. You know, I wouldn't worry that you, you, know, you have a lot in... It's the training of the staff who work in that sector that's going to make a difference. And getting the right staff and getting stable staff. Stable staff is tremendously important. Uh, one of the, re is the younger the staff are, the younger, sorry, the younger the children are, the more important stability of staff is. Just following up on that, I mean, yes. the, the Danish study focused on issues such as pedagogical training yeah. and the number of men. Now we have virtually yeah, no yeah. men. Let me, uh, I'll go back. That you, lots of people ask me about this. I think I'll go back and show you that slide. Because it is quite an interesting slide. Why on earth should men make a difference? Well, I'll tell you why it is. Um, in Denmark, as in all the Scandinavian countries, they've had for many years a move for, uh, to increase the number of men working in the preschool sector because obviously it's overwhelmingly women. Okay? So they've, been, they've had advertising programs, they've had training programs, government incentive programs, and they've in improved the situation a little bit. They've improved, say, from 1% up to about 10%. You know, so it's 10 times better, but it's still very bad. Okay? Now the thing of it is, Every centre in Denmark wants a ma man on their staff. So the men who are trained can pick and choose which centre to go to, and they tend to choose the best centres to go to. <laughs> um, uh, and the other ones are more, tr uh, more obviously related to the inequality, yeah. yeah. OK. Yes. I'm talking as a granddad, and I yes. can tell you something I never had, which was, you know, an iPad. I right. see a lot of kids uh, right. interacting with them. Technology. Okay. First of all, I would say TV is by and large a waste of time for kids. You know, sat in front of a TV is not a, an interesting, useful experience for kids. The reason it's not a, a useful experience for kids is it's not interactive. That is. The, the behavior of the television does not depend upon what the child does. The child can say, oh, no, no, no. And, you know, no, on the TV, they do whatever they're going to do anyway. Okay? Now, if you can get iPads, and I've been actually, I've, in another project, we've been doing this. I've been working on a project with iPads where we've been trying to develop iPad programs which your preschool children can interact with. Uh, yeah. If you can produce technological devices which provide interactive experiences for children, then yes, I would say they have, there is a potential there. But it needs to be genuinely interactive, where the child's behavior and what it does, uh, that could control what's happening. And the child can learn that, can learn that control. Yeah. Are you optimistic about the future in Britain? <laughs> <laughs> well, it'd be fashionable to say well, I, I wasn't optimistic. Um, but the the fact is that we've moved from a situation which, while it's not a long way, got a long way to go, is better now than it was 20 years ago. So we are on an upward trajectory, I think, in this country. It's critically dependent, because of the political situation, on the economic situation of the country. Whenever we, as I said, we, we were lucky back in 2010, we got, uh, Danny Alexander was in charge of the, uh, the education budget at that time, and he decided he wanted to protect preschool. So we were lucky, you know, Danny Alexander, uh, in place at that time. Uh, if the economy stays relatively healthy, 
then I think further developments in this area will, and will take place. Uh, for example, the government, Danny Alexander again, in November of last year, as his parting gift, as it were, released 15 million for a pilot program on new parenting support programs for the, year, for the year zero to two, where you saw there was a gap in what we know. Uh, that will be spent, that 15 million will be spent on some pilot programs over the next few years. Which the idea is those pilot programs could then, if they're successful, then be rolled out more generally. So um, the instances like that lead me to be optimistic. But I'm also very realistic. I've worked an awful lot with government. I've worked with every single minister for children that has, ha that, that has existed in this country. The first was Margaret Hodge in 2002. And I've worked with everyone since. And none of them are a patch on Margaret Hodge. Margaret Hodge was by far the best of them. Uh, I would say Margaret Hodge and Beverly Hughes were relatively effective ministers. Every other one was a waste of bloody time. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.